Danny Jenkins here, CEO of Threat Locker. I'm joined by Liam uh, Lovtos. He's one of our engineers. He's actually a new engineer with Threat Locker, and he's been working on me on some of the tricks and hacking tips for, for, for you guys for this session. This is our first session like this, so we're kind of playing it by ear a little bit. And if anyone wants to ask questions or join in or raise their hand and talk, you know, please feel free to do so. Um, this is the first of one of many. So hopefully we're going to give you a, a decent enough overview, some, some pretty cool tricks and uh, today and then if you join us again next month at the it nation one we have a, a much longer session as well which will go into more detail uh, michael should be joining us as well because he's gonna he's got some cool things as well to show you um, now i wish i had more time because i don't think i'm going to get nearly as much in but we'll see how it goes um, i'm just going to share my screen and you're going to see a powerpoint but i promise this is not going to be a powerpoint this is really so i remember what to say and where to go to next which part to go to next um, so uh, I want to start with really what is hacking and what, what does it mean to be a hacker? And th see this, this, my slide isn't finished because it's supposed to have a picture of a, a, a big, the big guy from Jurassic Park that can sit in his computer with a green screen on it. And, uh, but apparently, uh, I forgot to paste it in there. So if, if you can just envision that for me, that would be great. <laughs> uh, but be, being a hacker is not about typing in codes and suddenly getting into a system. It's not a John Travolta movie with swordfish or it's not some guy sitting in front of a green screen that's either, or, or some girl sitting in front of a green screen. Like it, it, it's really about much more than that. And it, it's, it's more, it's more about finding things that you're not supposed to be able to do, doing things you're not supposed to be able to do in a system and finding ways to do that. And I think, you know, I've met a lot of hackers and I wouldn't consider myself a good hacker, although I can come up with some pretty innovative things. I mean, I'm certainly not as good as you know, some guy called Dmitry in Russia, and uh, he's probably much scarier. But essentially, the, the best hackers, the best people at creating and finding vulnerabilities are the most curious. And we're going to show you some of the vulnerabilities and some of the things we found to get around security. And I, I, I'm going to focus on six parts, uh, which is six of many different ways. One is the research that's required because th that's really something that people miss. They think they get in front of a computer and type some keys and they're now in someone's system. But a lot of hacking requires research and, uh, and planning ahead. And I've done a lot of white hat stuff and every time I've been successful, I, I, it's because I, I spent a bit of time beforehand. I'm gonna go into that. Uh, vulnerability, so Liam's gonna help us with this. We're gonna show you how to install, we're not actually gonna install Metasploit because that'll take two hours, but we're gonna give you the link so you can find out how to download and install Metasploit. We're gonna show you how to do some basic vulnerability test uh, exploits like um, Eternal Blue um, on Windows 7 and, and give you some examples so you can get familiar with those toolkits. So hopefully you can go away and find more tools for that. Uh, the other thing we wanna talk about is phishing, which, is a little bit more boring, but I'm going to show you some really interesting stuff here that you might not have thought of and some tools you can use to, to fish somebody. And the idea of this is not to get you guys to go out and fish people and not to get you guys to go out and run malware on people's machines. It's really to educate you more and maybe get you to show people how dangerous the world is. And if you can convince your customers that look, your system isn't that secure, I was able to do this, this or this, then it's much it gives you a much better uh, sales pitch. The other area is malicious software. And I'm not just talking about malware or viruses. We often think of malicious software back from the 90s and the 2000s where somebody sends a piece of ransomware, a specific piece of code and it's used. But the reality is there's so much malware, there's so much malicious software out there that has nothing to do with, won't get detected by antivirus. It's custom written software intended to be Malicious. We've got the rubber duckies and um, Liam's going to jump in here um, and her, uh, on that as well. We've got a couple of scripts here. Uh, we are, we, I think all our scripts should be in our box by now. If they're not by now, they will be soon. So we have an MSP box where we share all our marketing collateral and we've also got some rubber ducky scripts and things like that. So if you haven't already got access to that, ask whoever you're working with in Threat Locker and they'll get you access to that. And then um, we're going to touch on wireless malware as well. Um, before I begin, I have a little bit of a riddle. Um, so I was talking to a friend of mine three or four weeks ago, and he's an M he runs an MSP, a level three engineer, really smart guy. I mean, he's not stupid, I know. And he, he said, you'd never be able to get onto my system. And I kind of got a bit annoyed with that because I was like, 
he's just being cocky and you should never say that as an MSP never say those words because at very least karma is going to come and bite you in the ass and prove you rock so what I said to him well, what do you mean I can't get on your system he says oh I, I, I've got really secure passwords I patched them up to date I said well there's always a way and uh, so I started looking at how can I get on this guy's system? How can I get on there? And I, uh, and I set out a goal to get him to run malware on his computer, to get him to, uh, not real malware that was going to encrypt his files, but something that essentially execute code I could gain access to his machine. And, and I also got the added bonus that I managed to steal his RMM password, which he promptly changed afterwards. And this was all with his permission. I didn't go off and do it. You know, I, I, I said I could do it. And he said, okay, I'm not. I don't believe you. And I said, well, why don't you give me a try? So we went through a process. There's a, the reason I call this a riddle is I'm going to talk about the other stuff. And at the end, I'm going to show you how. I, I did this this morning in whatever state I was in, Delaware, and um, at, at another event. And there was, not, there was probably about 70 or 80 MSPs in the room. And none of them guessed how. And they all came up and they all came out with the same same oh, you fished him, you got him to run a rubber ducky, uh, things like that. So, um, but think about that throughout there and see if you can figure out, if you, if you were at the event this morning, that's kind of cheating, so don't. Uh, if, you, if you think you have an answer, throw it in the chat as well. I'm just gonna promote Michael because he's uh, arrived as well, if I can figure out how on this uh, Zoom session. How do I promote, where's the screen gone on Zoom? Sorry guys, I'm trying to figure out how to use Zoom, which is not a good start for someone who's supposed to be technical. There it is. Okay, so no one's got it right yet in the chat, just in case, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I, just in case they thought they did. Um, so, um, okay, how's it? we just got Michael join us as well. Uh, he's our CTO. He's gonna show one of the demonstrations on something I did before when we get to the malicious software side. Um, I'm gonna start with the most boring topic and I'm starting with that. I'm hoping that we don't lose anyone at this topic, but it is also the most important topic. And that is research. If you want to go after a company, if you want to be successful uh, and actually do something viable and get the data just for the purpose of good reasons, we don't want you doing it for bad reasons, you have to plan in advance. And the, the first thing I would always do is build an org chart of the company. It doesn't have to be everyone, but I want to know who the CEO is, who his assistant is, who's the CFO, who pays the invoices, who answers the phone, all of those things. I want to know. I want to know. I want to know if they're males, they're females, uh, because there's, there's there's nothing worse than a phishing email. Um, our CRO, COO is, is named Sammy, and Sammy's my wife, by the way. And the amount of times I get phishing emails or calls saying I spoke to Sammy, he said to call you. It's like, well, pretty sure Sammy's not a man, so don't talk crap to me. But there's nothing worse than not knowing. <laughs> Getting those kind of details is very, very important. So find out who's in the company. And if you can, find out a little bit of information about them, who their MSP is. And this is important because we're seeing this a lot. We're seeing you guys get spoofed a lot and people sending clients to team viewer links and things like that to your clients trying to get onto their machines because they know who the MSP is and then what security software they use. And this is important, the security software as well, because I remember... Um, I was doing a presentation for an investor uh, a few years ago and they were really, really cocky and they were like, our oh, antivirus will block anything. And so I, I went home and I opened a box of wine and I did say box, yes. And I said, you know, what? I'm going to write a piece of malware. It's going to copy all the data. It's not going to get detected by the antivirus. The problem is I only had a day to do it and I couldn't find out what their antivirus was. So I had to test it with like 10 different antiviruses and I had to modify it and check which antivirus is running so I could run different software. If you know what security software they're running, it's easier to, for you to test your, your theories against it. Uh, you know, you're not always gonna be able to find that out, but if you can, great. Um, social media, I, I mean, I can't stress this enough, uh, political viewpoints. It is amazing what people will click on in a political world. If you send an email out to a Trump supporter saying, 
see this video of Sleepy Joe or send a video out to a Biden supporter saying, oh, the, the PP tapes have been released to Trump. And I, I, then it's amazing how many people will click on those. If, if they are, if you know what their political link is, that who they, who they support, then you can actually really manipulate that. There's, there's so much psychological stuff around that. It's unbelievable. So if you can find out, if you can go on their Facebook and you find out what parties they support, do they, are they activists in any community? You can really play to those human emotions and it really helps you get into those. What events are attending? And we're going to show you this on the, the fishing and you know, where are they? When are they going to be there? That's if someone's out of town. You know, they're out of town. That's a great time to email and who their customers and their vendors are. So who, who's their customers? So if you email from a customer, if someone knows, oh, this is your client and they email from you, you're more likely to trust that email. You're more likely to respond or let your guards down and, and vendors and, and who works for those customers and vendors. Now, this sounds like a lot of work, but the reality is you can, an eight hour, I mean, I'd spend eight hours on someone I was doing a pen test on and I would get so much information. It was unbelievable. Um, so it wasn't that boring. And I don't actually think, I think we gained three people. So, I, I, so if anyone fell asleep and hopefully this will wake you up now. There, there really is quite a, a few different ways you can get into a system. And the most stereotypical way is the 400 pound guy eating, drinking soda, uh, typing on the green screen um, and sending codes in. And the reason I bring that up is because this is probably the closest to that stereotype and that is vulnerabilities. And the, there's two types of vulnerabilities. There's actual vulnerability, vulnerabilities. They are bugs in the system that are not supposed to be there, that, that definitely not, they, they are a fundamental flaw in the system. Uh, they're essentially code that's bad, but it wasn't intended to be bad. Um, and that could be something like Eternal Blue or uh, the Internet Explorer vulnerability last year where or Blue Keep, any of those, they're actual vulnerabilities on systems that m Microsoft have patched. They said this was not there. And then there's supposed features. And th this is all supposed limitations of uh, products. And to give you um, an example of these, the most obvious one is macros in a Word document. So Microsoft Office has the ability to call PowerShell and run PowerShell commands. Now that is a feature of Office. Microsoft has no intention of releasing a patch that stops that from happening. But it's a feature that makes you vulnerable. It's a feature that can be compromised and used against you. Um, uh, like run DLL, here's another supposed feature. Run DLL, uh, or sorry, RegServe, uh, I think run DLL as well actually, has the ability to run code from the internet in memory. So directly from a GitHub. So these are features that kind of make you vulnerable because it's very hard to detect those type of threats. Um, and then there's other things as well. And some of them actually change. So, uh, I, I mean, one example, I have a, I, I'm struggling to remember my kid's age now, 11 year old at the time. And he found a feature on the iPhone that allows you to record the screen because he's nosy and kids apparently have loads of times to look through their settings. So he found this screen recorder. What he found was when he turned on the screen recorder that, it records anyone entering their password. So what he did is he, I and mean, we thought he was a great kid. He never asked for more screen time, but what he did is he put his screen recording on and it didn't show the red bar. The red bar was hidden when you're entering the password. And, that, and then he handed the phone to my wife and said, can I have 15 minutes extra screen time to finish this on Netflix? And she wasn't her normal self. And she said, yes. Um, and she put her code in. Well, he recorded those, those button pushes and he then had a password and then he never asked for the password again until three months later we caught him. <laughs> um, and now that is, that is a feature of the iPhone that you can record the screen. The, I suppose the, that has changed now, that was gone. Uh, Apple were very responsive when we reported it to them and they, they, they gave him credit for finding it. And on the CV, I say credit, that means posting his name, not giving them, give him a free Apple watch or anything. But uh, the, the point is that is a feature that turned into a actual vulnerability because Apple changed their opinion on what it should do. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of features here that are vulnerabilities or limitations of products. And I'm going to discuss some of them as we get through the time. Now, Liam, are you, can you hear us? Okay. Yep. I can hear you. 
so now, now one of the big tools we use um, to exploit vulnerabilities is a tool called Metasploit. And this is available on Windows. It's available on um, uh, Kali Linux. And Liam, I don't know if you, are you able to share your screen? Because what I'd like to go through is just, first of all, go through where, they, where people can find this tool, where they can download it from, because it, anyone can download it. The hardest thing about installing it is disabling your antivirus so it doesn't eat it um, or, or create any exceptions. And then just kind of, we don't want to go through a full install and then go through an exploit, maybe show them, I'm going to point at a Windows 7 machine that's vulnerable and I'm going to exploit it. I'm going to pull up a command prompt or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah, I can share my screen. I'll throw these links in here real quick for the Metasploit download uh, into the chat. Here is the Metasploit download, as well as where you can grab ISOs for Kali Linux. It's, it's worth noting as well, guys, there's a, there's a, it is a lot slower, um, but there's a Windows version. If you're, if you're not a big Linux buff and you don't want to take on that overhead, you can install it in, in Windows. It, you need a bit more CPA, but it's, it still works. Right, so uh, we got the Kali Linux box here as the hacker, and we've got our Windows 7 machine here uh, as the target. And find the IP of that. Obviously, in a real-world situation, you'd be doing scans to find vulnerable systems, but just to make things easier, we'll throw that there. Open up our terminal and start Metasploit with the Metasploit framework console command. We'll do that quietly because it throws a lot of messages at you. And for those of you who know nothing about uh, Linux, the terminal is just command prompt. I'm sure that's mostly obvious, but uh, but and it's exact at this point the exact same process of opening it in Windows. You just run. Oh, somebody said they're not seeing them. I didn't get any. Oh, did you send the links just to the panelists there? Uh, well, let me paste them in again. Gotcha. And just went to panelists. I'll, re I'll repost them, guys, um, into the everyone group. Yep. Sorry about that. Um, there you go. Uh, so for this, we're going to be using the MS17 underscore 010 exploit, also known as Eternal Blue. Uh, it was developed by the National Security Agency, found out in, I believe, 2017 uh, when WannaCry started to come out and people were using this to uh, basically put ransomware on companies' computers and systems. So, uh, so here, here's what's interesting about this one is this was a vulnerability that was exploited within six weeks of Microsoft releasing the patch. And, uh, and the thing about it was six weeks seems like a long time, but because it was exploiting RPC protocols, it really affected servers because what happened was people got malware on their machine, they ran WannaCry, and then it connected to all of their servers and it's able to connect as a global admin. Um, or a, 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 essentially a local admin on the servers. So they were able to delete backups from the backup servers. They, they were able to delete uh, and encrypt files and do whatever they needed to without any privileges, without any usernames, using this exploit. And in so many cases, companies hadn't patched their servers within six weeks of that happening. And it, unfortunately, there's been much shorter periods of time than that as well, six weeks. But this, this one was obviously one of the most notorious exploits that was that hit more companies than anything else right so next up what we'd want to do is to use the scanning uh, module here with uh, auxiliary and uh, if you're wondering where it is it's right here it's going to bring up all the ms17010 exploits so we're going to go scanner smb smb underscore ms17010 uh, once we're using this tool here, we can set the remote host to what this machine is. So 192.168.137.22. Uh, and this can be done as a range to scan pretty much a whole network to find out uh, what machines are vulnerable. Uh, but once we've done that, it's simple to say an exploit and it'll tell us that the host is uh, vulnerable. Obviously, this is more useful for when you're trying to find out, you know, from a whole network, what's, uh, what's vulnerable. Uh, you're gonna have to put a range in there, can't you, Liam? Of, yep, uh, you can uh, do a, pretty much a whole IP range. To scan the network and see what's... 
Um, so yeah, for this case, we're only doing one, but you could put a range in there, scan a whole network, uh, find anything from there. Um, but from, for now, we're going to move over to the actual exploit, uh, which is exploit Windows SMB uh, MS17010 eternal blue. It's going to tell us that it's defaulting to the meter preter reverse TCP payload, which is what we're going to be using. Uh, we can show options here. And it'll tell us everything we need to put in. Uh, local host is already set. Local port's already set. So the only thing we need to set right now is the remote host and the process name. So we're going to set our hosts uh, to the 192.168.137.22. And then we're going to set process name to lsass.exe, which is the local security authentication service on Windows. You can attach to any process. Uh, the reason we're using this one is because it gives you system authority. Um, I'm going to set the process there. Now, if everything's right up here, we got yes, 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 yes. All right. Uh, it should be as simple as just hitting exploit. if you spell it right. All right, that's odd. Let's see, show options again. Communication error be SMB. All right, let's use the exploit again. Make sure this is all good here. Ah, we have to exit the meter preter session here. Uh, once we do this, we can show options again, make sure everything's in here right. Make sure we got our local host set properly with IP ADR. Uh, Liam, I, I did find before. Um, Yeah, I, I think um, I think I was muted when I was just talking. I I, I just um, I, I found before if you if you've exploited it once, you might have to restart the machine on it. Although, yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, so you might want to reboot your victim. And um, I, I noticed um, Michael. Oh, maybe that wasn't the person who raised the hand. I didn't mean to. Uh, so Brian uh, McCafty has raised his hand. So I'm just going to unmute this so allow Brian to talk. One second. Brian, did you have a question? No, I was fumbling around trying to get a bigger screen. I must have raised my hand in there. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> I'm going to let you go back to, to watching Liam trying to figure this out. All right. Now it should be as simple as saying exploit. I, I ran this right before we got on, so that was probably the problem. Uh, make sure we have all of our show. Options correct. We got local uh, process. Secondary uh, preference already be hacked. I used to do this on all the demos, and then I stopped because it was so unstable. We've got our second session open, and there we go. Uh, now we've got basically full access. We have system access so we can go sysinfo here um, and find out there's two logged on users obviously the target user and us uh, from here it's basically whatever you want to do um, there's a lot of options within meter preter um, for things you can do you can inject key keystrokes you can start a uh, key logger uh, you can even record their microphone their webcam or, or you, can, you can open a command prompt, which is probably the scariest one, a command prompt. Or right. Prompt. And uh, it's this easy. There you go. And you're literally just on that machine now as if you were a local admin. 
and there was no username or password credentials being passed in. Now, this is worth saying that the, the thing is with exploits is once the machines are patched, quite often they disappear, this type of traditional exploit. So while these are cool, and if your client, if, you, if you're prospecting a client that hasn't been patched, it's great to say, look, you are in a load. I mean, I'm not lying. I was talking to an MSP last year who are a threat like a customer and they won't be one day because they hear me saying this over and over again. But this guy has not patched his service in four years and he refuses flat out to patch his service. Um, uh, so somebody voted that the webcam is the creepiest and scariest option. I, I'm, I, I'm not sure that's true. If someone wants to look at my face or even look at me getting changed, their life is really bad. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I almost feel like looking at my email is a bit more scary to me. Um, the, um, and if someone's running Windows XP, XP should be vulnerable as well. So trying to get them to patch or at least take remediative action, that would be great. Older versions of uh, Windows 10 are also vulnerable uh, to a kind of deviation of this exploit. Um, oh, oh, yes, if you've got Windows 10 as well, all of it. But if someone's not patching, it's very, very ideal. And there are a few different exploits in Metasploit. If you download Metasploit, we can share this video afterwards, but you can also look at other, uh, there's lots of other tools as well, which are great for showing the clients. Win 2000 server, oh, that's painful. Um, somebody retired, uh, finally convinced their client to get rid of a Windows 2000 server. That's only 20 years old. Um, okay, so I'm going to jump back. Um, if you can, I end your sc share, screen yeah, sharing, and I'm going to jump onto the next part of this. If I can figure out how to share my screen again. I have another challenge for the rubber ducky side to get this laptop on Zoom, but we're going to figure that out. Okay, so <laughs> most vulnerabilities that we see can be stopped with good patching. And as, as someone who's gone into a lot of networks, I, I would very seldom rely on vulnerabilities. I mean, it's kind of like saying, okay, I'm going to rob this guy's house, but I'm going to check if the front door's unlocked before I start breaking it. And if, if they've got vulnerabilities, basically their front door's unlocked, so you don't need to use a crowbar. But in most cases, you're not going to have those kind of, that kind of success when you're, when you're talking to your clients because they should be patched. Um, I just have to, apparently, I have to allow some of our other team to share. Give me one second. The Zoom thing is struggling today. Um, make some people some co-hosts. Now, the other type of vulnerability, which is the supposed features, they're a little bit harder to actually deal with. And I'm going to give you two examples. I wish I had one of them ready, but I don't actually have it, and I haven't used it in two years. And this one probably is the scariest one. There's the Microsoft Office macros. And guys, these Office macros, it is so easy to write a piece of code that will download a piece of malware from the internet in an Office macro. And, or run a PowerShell command or do anything like that. So that is obviously one of the first ones, but there's also another one. And I, I kind of hope everyone's gonna go away after this call and I tell them this one and actually look, especially if you've ever had a client with ransomware, go away and do this because there's something called an Active Directory filter. And uh, we have one and unfortunately I didn't get it ready in time for this. And what it does, it's a DLL you install on your Active Directory server and an active directory password filter, sorry. And what it does is when the user changes their password, regardless of how it's changed, it sends that, it captures that password. And the purpose of that filter is to allow you to implement advanced rules to stop people having weak passwords. So you can use the active directory rules with a built-in filter, or you can create your own rule saying, okay, we're gonna create our own algorithm. We're gonna use third party software that stops weak passwords. But for that third party software to be able to check if that password's secure, it actually gets the password in clear text. Um, now I'm sure it's in a protected session, but here's the point. We have a tool here 
that when you put on a domain controller, it actually sends all password changes to a REST API on the internet. So if you change your password and you have this filter installed on your domain controller, it will just send us a new password. If obviously you don't have ours installed. Um, it's an absolutely terrifying feature in Windows. And if, if you've had a client who's been compromised before, especially at the domain admin level, go away and I'm just going to pull that up how you can check. Um, I'm going to send you a link for that because I know there's a, I think it's a, if you can give me one. There's a registry key and they're underneath here. a list of all the plugins. I can find the chat again. I've got too many screens here. I'm sure somebody's just pasted it. Apparently Zoom does not want to play ball today. The chat is just not popping up. Technology, Sorry? Struggling a bit with technology. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, I'm clicking on it and it's just not appearing. Um, I'm just trying to get this into the chat. I had it open for a minute. I'm seeing if it's behind a window. I have so much stuff open on my computer, it's impossible to find anything. I think it's actually just broken. Okay, I've definitely minimized everything now, so I'll try one more time. Chat. Okay, apparently Zoom. Uh, Michael, do you mind sending a message if it, when I click on it, it just pops up because it's just not working. That work? Oh, it's not even flashing. I've got a message. Isn't that fun? Okay, well, I'm going to leave Michael to look at the chats. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to send Michael uh, the link to post in there because I cannot get the chat open. Zoom's broken. Oh, I just sent that to all panelists. One second, everyone. Yeah, Colin's telling me how to use Zoom, but <laughs> I, 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 it's just not working. I can click on the button, it just doesn't come up. It's just broken. Uh, it's, I think it's just, it's frozen somewhere. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about, and, and we're going to put some example macros, by the way, in this box, because I know we don't have enough time to get through them all. But we're going to put some example macros of Word documents that can download things from the internet that you can test with. Uh, in the box drive afterwards. So you can actually play with that a bit more. But you, one of the things I would suggest, and I didn't mention it, is if you're doing macros for the purpose of um, penetration testing, sign the macros. It makes them a lot easier to get permitted. And once somebody permits one, that, that all macros from that signature will be permitted. So phishing is the next conversation. Now, we often think of phishing as a... Um, Somebody gets a link, they click on the link and they, they enter their credentials. And, and that is at the very basic concept phishing. And it's, and it, it, you see it used all the time and it amazes me today how many people fall for it. And we do uh, user training in our own company and it, it surprises me. Did someone really click on that link? Are they really that uninformed? Is that the nice way of saying it? <laughs> um, so, um, but the um but there's a lot more advanced ways of doing it I, I remember um well this was kind of a joke um i wanted to convince somebody their flight had been cancelled once um and i 
I decided to clone the entire airline's website to do that. And I want to show you this tool because if you ever want to clone something to create a phishing campaign, you don't have to do all the work yourself to go and build that site and make it look. If you ever wonder how these things look so perfectly like the Microsoft site, you can clone these with something called HTTP or WinHTT track, it's called. Um, again, I'll show you the download here. I'm going to post that into the chat. No, I can't post it into the chat because it's not post working. It to me. <laughs> I'm going to post it to Michael and he's going to post it into the chat. What this tool allows you to do is download entire websites. And sometimes it's a bit crappy and sometimes it's okay. I downloaded the Threat Locker website just before I started here. And literally all you do in here is um, you open it up, you give it the name, uh, you choose a, a folder for it. Uh, so just call it test. Uh, you give the URLs and it goes off and gets all those URLs and pulls the website into a folder. So I create a folder here and this should, I haven't even looked at it. Um, that's obviously if I go into Threat Locker. And I didn't really do that good a job. Normally it does a better job than that. <laughs> so uh, apparently this time we did a really bad job, but it, it goes and takes the site and normally it does a pretty good job. So I don't know if it failed, um, but it, you can go off and you can clone the entire site. Oh, I know what that is. Um, it's because I'm running it locally. It's blocking the JavaScript. I think if I run it in, maybe in Internet Explorer, it might run better. It's not that it didn't do a good job. When you run files locally in Windows, they block the JavaScript. Uh, allow lock content. I'll allow anything. It's still not working, but I'm not just not sure if it works in Internet Explorer in general. But it's um, essentially, it's, it's, you can take this tool, you can point it at a website, it'll give you a relatively accurate representation and then you can edit it as you please. Normally I've had better luck than that. I did clone an entire airline site one day and it looked almost spot on. Uh, but so, then, and what I did in that is I literally clo cloned it and put a notice on the homepage that these flights have been canceled and the, and then to click here to rebook. And it wasn't phishing. It was just as a, as a joke for someone. And uh, what I did is they were using their laptop. So I, I couldn't, um, because they were using their laptop, I couldn't change their host file and I wasn't sending the link. They were just going to Ryanair.com and checking the site. So what I did is I went onto the Wi-Fi router, which was my, there at my house. Wi-Fi router and I changed the DNS to point to my DNS server and then redirected Ryanair.com to, to my site. Um, this was 15 years ago, so it's a, it's a long time since then, but it's, it's very, very effective tool at cloning sites and then you can just edit it and collect the data yourself. So if you're doing a, a successful phishing campaign to get traditional credentials, this is a, a pretty cool tool that saves you a bit of time. Um, the reality is um, phishing is a bit more advanced than that today. <laughs> it's more targeted. It comes from similar email addresses and it's um, uh, multi-touch. Uh, so you, you, you're not just touching the, the attacker or the victim once you're engaging with them backward and forward. And uh, now I have a slide here and I don't know if anyone wants to take a guess why this says what it says on the slide and what that means, because this one might shock people before I actually go and tell you what it means. Again, I can't see the chat. Hey, we've got the chat. We've got um, one or... Oh, you got... You, some people got it. Okay. I, yeah, L or L or one. One or letter one. A lot of uh, basically um, the letter one. Somebody has said H-I-J. Okay, so it is L or I. And if we move to the next slide. So, and the reason I bring this up is in Microsoft Outlook, it is impossible to see the difference between the letter, a capital I and a lowercase L. Um, and actually- I've most... also pointed out that you should um, switch to present mode so they can't see the next um, slide. Oh, well that, <laughs> <laughs> that, might, uh, that might give it away. I was surprised how everyone was getting it, uh, fun with funds. Now, there's a reason I say this is um, because I, if you want to, uh, I used this attack before to, to trick someone and fish someone who was a lot smarter than you think. And if you have a domain name with the letter L in it, what you should do is you should go away, first of all, and register the letter I. And if you've got two L's in it, you, get a, you have to register like five domain names to get the calculations. You've got three, you get where I'm going. It's getting complicated. But if you have a domain name, make sure you register the alternative letter because 
if you register threat oinka.com instead of threatlocker.com, which you can't because we've already done it. Um, and a bit of an attacker was, and they were to set up DMARC, set up SPF, and then email our users. The users could engage with them in Outlook and they would have no idea that the email address was wrong. They just wouldn't know. So if you're trying to get into a network, this is a $10 thing you can do that makes it a lot harder for them to mistrust you. And because you're registering the DMARC, it gets through a lot of the anti-spam and the email filtering systems because you've got the DMARC, you've got the SPF, the DKIM, and that's all in there. Now, this is a very simple phishing email. Uh, so email here from Michael. Uh, you can see it says michael.jenkins.threatlocker at gmail.com. This is basically you Nigerian scam. You'd be surprised how many click people will click on this Nigerian scam. But it, it, it says... You'd like to, I would like you to download and pay this invoice and it has a link to the invoice. And then it says, thank you, kind sir. I mean, that couldn't be any more obvious. Now I will tell you that couldn't be more obvious, but you will be surprised how many people will click on that. You'll be surprised how many people will fall for that and click on that link. Um, if you're going to do emails like this, whether they're phishing and this, this one in particular wasn't phishing, it was more of an illegitimate download to download malware and get them to run it on their machine. Um, but this is much more effective and I want to show you, and I, I, I don't know, Michael, is the text big enough on here? Cause I'm a little bit concerned that I'm putting, um, I can see it fine. If anyone has any problems and um, do you want to pop it into chat, but looks fine news, to me. I got my chat back. So, um, it just came oh, up. Okay. It, I didn't even have to click anything. It just came up 10 minutes later. Um, so he, he is a much more effective email. So first of all, the domain name is Threat Oinka, uh, not Threat Locker. So uh, Michael, uh, I mean, we sent this, it's, a, it's our test. Um, but it says I, we need to pay a ConnectWise in, invoice. Why that's important is because the attacker has spent the time to know that we are a partner of ConnectWise. So Terra is more likely to trust it because they know this name. It's built more relationships. The word urgently there's something about urgently that just we're in trouble. They're going to cancel the event if we don't pay it. And that gets people to do things that they shouldn't do because they're scared. Suddenly that their, their fear isn't that someone's trapped them. Their fear is Michael, who's a CTO is a bit of an asshole is telling them to do something and they need it done fast. Uh, so they're, they're focusing on that. Um, the other thing that's in this email that makes it look more legitimate is it says, I know Danny is traveling. Now that's probably public information because I was speaking at an event in Delaware this morning. <laughs> so the attacker could come in and say, I know Danny is traveling. Can you, uh, so again, that builds more trust and they're gonna cancel the event if we don't pay it. So there's a number of things here that suddenly makes the recipient want to click on this link and pay the invoice. Now, this link didn't pay the invoice, uh, that, and this link doesn't exist, but the, the link, I've done this attack before with someone, and what we did, if I get, I'm just zooming in a little bit here, is we sent him to a page which said, you need to download Adobe Reader, and the latest version of Adobe, and if you actually notice in the email here, there's a chain here that says, it's telling me I need to update Adobe. Now, this looks like it's going to Michael, but it's not, and then, will it not, will it let you update it yourself? And that's what he's saying. So now the attacker, as far as Tara's concerned, she's having a conversation with Michael. And he's gone through a lot of detail to make it look like that. She's clicked on this invoice. It says you need the latest version of Adobe Reader. And Tara doesn't know anything about Adobe Reader. So in her mind, she's just going to, it's gonna, she's going to click and it's going to download. Now maybe she, she's really paying attention and she wants to um, make sure that this is actually a Adobe Reader she's downloaded. Maybe, maybe this is actually an IT guy or maybe it's uh, someone a little bit smarter. Uh, and even IT guys can be tricked as I'm going to show you later on. So what we did on, and this is, I've done this before, is when they click download, go to Adobe, it downloads this file. This is not Adobe Reader. Then what it does is it redirects them immediately to the Adobe website. What that means is the user checks the URL, says it's Adobe, it's got an Adobe icon. 
the file auto downloaded when the page loaded and then they just click on it without even thinking they've now ran malware malicious software on their computer and just <laughs> apologies um just a few little changes here to the email making i mean the domain name was subtle but you don't have to do them all but even some of these together allow you to have a very very successful attack now if you think by the way that you, People won't go after your clients with these types of attack because it's too much work. You're completely wrong. I've seen clients, you know, 10 user companies, five user companies get attacked by much more sophisticated attacks than this without, uh, uh, and without uh, any, any problems whatsoever. They just, because they do, these attackers, they're going to get $200,000 even from a 10 employee business. So they will go after these companies and get them to run something. Um, so, and I went the wrong way. When you're drafting these emails, put as much information in as you can find. If you know someone's traveling, urgency, partner names, they're all great things. And then if you can do a reply chain, so if you can have a similar email address, that's important. I was doing training for our kids' school, uh, say four years ago now, I've been saying it for so long, I can't remember when it was. And <coughs> the day before the training, we emailed 60 teachers um, from a spoofed address with a reply to of a number at Gmail asking them for their passwords for an urgent system update. 23 teachers sent their passwords to a Gmail account. Now, a year later, we did training again and the number was better, but this time what we did is we spoofed the, we registered a similar domain and we sent it from a very similar domain and the business manager's name email address asking for their social security numbers and bank details. Seven teachers send those details. So the, the, the training worked, but it didn't work enough because we still got seven teachers send their social security number and bank details. Now talking about malicious software, <laughs> the getting someone to run malicious software was always my go-to. And that's probably why we started throughout locker because phishing, I would get their password, but so what, I've got their email. And what the email would give me is access to send them more information. You know, I'd definitely build relationships. I could, I could get trust and things like that. But ultimately to get onto their system, I mean, getting their office 365 email, isn't going to get me their files off their file server. It's not going to get me their payroll system. It's not going to get me anything like that. So what I would always do is always about getting malicious software to run and getting somebody to run that malicious software. And again, this doesn't have to be hard in the previous case. This, they, I've used this exact attack. They ran that file because it wasn't that hard. We need to get, if you want to get on someone's system, you need to write a program that gets you the data they need. And I'm going to show you a couple of ways we can do this now. And I think Michael's got, is going to share his screen on one of them. But the first thing you want to do is figure out what you want to get. A lot of red team, um, people will, will just touch. They'll just literally go, I touched your file server. You were exploited. But sometimes you need to do more than that because when you go into your client and you say, okay, well, I'm going to show you, I can get on your file server and they'll say, oh, great. But they, they say, well, okay, you touched my file server, but you saw something that's public that Becky on the front desk is, has got access to. You didn't get anything valuable. So I always wanted to get further than that just because I wanted to prove it. So I'm going to show you how I did that on many cases. Uh, again, I'm going to say this again, sign your code. Um, it's amazing how many antiviruses favor signed code versus non-signed code. You can get away with doing a lot more in your, in your code when you write a program um, if it's signed. Uh, if you don't know how to sign your code, you have to register at a company to Better Business Bureau or Yellow Pages. And by the way, you can add, you can register bogus companies. I registered, you know, like some crappy company named Hello One Two, you know, Bob's Knives or something like that and signed the code with that. And I put a name and that's all they're doing. So create a company name, sign your code. Most antivirus companies are giving you a much better credibility if your code signed. It's $100, $200. Don't sign it. Well, if, if you're doing it just for testing, you can use your own company name. But um, ransomware often collects a lot of data when it runs on your system. And the reason they do that is because they sell that data on afterwards. Everyone thinks, well, I restored for my backup. Well, not really, because they also took your email. They took I mean, think about it. What's in your email? I can guarantee most people have their tax return in their email. Uh, so, and that's a lot of data. 
And quite often what these guys do is they get that data with your ransomware attack and then they sell it on and that allows future ransomware attacks, future entry points and things like that. Um, I, I'm going, okay. So from a code point of view, writing any software, all software that you run on your computer is essentially malicious. It could be malicious. If you run Angry Birds, Angry Birds has access to all your files. So Angry Birds, if it's compromised, could copy your data, steal your data. Um, one of the things I would struggle with sometimes is I couldn't get someone important to open my code. I couldn't get them. I, I'd send them that link and they just wouldn't run Adobe. They weren't, they were too smart. They would say, I'm not running that. It's just stupid. And I, I was never worried about the antivirus because you could always get around the antivirus by making your code tidy, making sure everything's good. Um, of course it was first seen code, but one of the things I would do uh, to get to the smart people is I would, uh, and Michael's going to show you an example of this with the code now. Um, where I would get, I'll say Becky on the front desk. Becky is a fictional person, but it sounds like a really smart person's name. So um, uh, Becky on the front desk. I know if there's a Becky on here, I'm, I'm in trouble. Uh, I'd send her something, get her to open it, but I wouldn't just go after the server because she didn't have enough permissions. What I would do is I would um, you essentially replace the files on the file servers with executables. And I would always hide the original file. So I'd hide the Excel file, replace it with an executable with an Excel file name. And then when they open the executable, it would open the original file. So now somebody else in the company would go and open that file. Michael, do you want to share and I'll stop sharing and show, maybe show them how this code works. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> okay. Uh, just get my machine up. Hopefully that's sharing. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay, I'm gonna try and move it over to one that I can actually view. Tell me if you can see <coughs> it. Okay, um, so I've got a folder here, important files, couple of spreadsheets, subfolders, one called invoicing. Obviously it's not invoicing, but I can add data to it as they do. What I have here is just a very simple executable, doesn't need admin rights to run. And when I run that, I didn't, I'm hoping I disabled Threat Locker, I did. So this, this, um, is, this is essentially would have been the Adobe downloader. You disabled yeah. that, didn't you? Uh, let's run that now. Go back to my important files. And I, I would always, when somebody downloaded something, I would always give them something so they felt like they weren't being conned. So uh, Michael, Michael just did a, a quick version of this code, which literally just went in. And what it did... Um, didn't clean up after my last one. I'm as bad as Liam now. <laughs> okay, so as we go in here, I've got my Excel spreadsheets. I've still got my finances. I'm gonna open up my invoices. And as you can see, there is my invoice file. I'm working away fine. But what you didn't realize is that's actually an executable. Yeah and not a net XE file. So the, the point is here is once you get one person in the company to run something, you can switch out files and Mike will show you the code. It's not really that complex. We, and we can share that code with you. It's, it's, it's just C sharp and I, I think it was actually Adrian that did it. So uh, yeah. he did a great job at just making it tidy. Um, the way I always did it was hide it. In this case, what they're actually doing is move them to a different folder. Um, yeah, so he's just moved it to the temp folder and then it runs. And then after it opens that thing, you can see here, we've got a you've been hacked file. So it's not actually doing any harm. Um, if I open up the code. So it consists of two executables. The first one is the one, that Adobe one that Danny's talking about. And what that does is that scans, in this case, a particular <coughs> folder, can scan anything, replaces all Excel documents with a second file, which it can download. Um, for the purpose of being able to give you this code, we've just made it so that it's simple in, in the, um, the temp folder for you. But there's the executable there. And what that does is it will open up the hidden or moved Excel spreadsheet and it will make sure that it opens fine, but then it executes the next part of the code. So let's just open up this code now. Just need to share uh, TL Heroes. Okay, so you should be able to see the code now. 
Okay, so, you want to zoom in a bit, Michael, because it's pretty small. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, so, I mean, that's this the, is the extent of it. This is the first file. You can see the file paths, it's getting the files. It's looking for Excel spreadsheets, and it is simply just moving them over and replacing them with that nastier executable. And you can point it at any path you'd like. Um, yeah. And then the, the second part is just the launcher, essentially. Yeah, which if I share that one there. The second one's even simpler, has two lines. First one is it will start that hidden or moved, in this case, moved file by taking it from the name. And the second part is it creates the you've been hacked text document, which obviously you can edit this to say whatever you want. The good thing is it's going to put it wherever that spreadsheet is. Yeah, and essentially that code there says you've been hacked, but it could equally upload your data to the internet. It could encrypt files and it could delete files. It could do whatever it wants. And yeah, effectively, after you've done that part, nobody's paying attention to what's happening. They've got their spreadsheet. They're working on their spreadsheet. You can install whatever you want. You can download whatever you want. If the user who happened to open that has domain admin, you've got access to the full domain. If they don't, maybe you just sit there and wait for the next person and see if they've got admin. And that can stay on those shares where most people aren't even going to notice the difference. OK. Well, I'm going to hijack your screen back then, Michael, if you don't mind, stop sharing. Yeah, no problem. I'm going to see where we are on time. And we're going to put this code in the box so you guys can carry on. Somebody mentioned in the chat about put, uh, putting external emails. Uh, disclaimer saying this is an external email. It's a great idea. If you, if you rely on all your staff actually paying attention, then, then uh, yeah, and I, I think it helps a bit. <laughs> but we have had some of our real senior techs do the dumbest things. And people are notoriously stupid sometimes and make stupid mistakes. Um, one of the things I would do once I was on these systems, and I would often do things like when they ran that code, I would install TeamViewer or, or download some remote access tool where I could get on and browse around because that allowed me to see what was in the system. Uh, I'd also look for things. I'd always like config files. So um, I would actually, if I don't know where my percent button is, um, I, I would show, um, I would extract config files, look in web.config files for IIS servers. People love to save SQL passwords and they're really powerful. So if you can get that data when you're on the system, that's a huge. Now I've got full access to SQL and SQL, guess what? It doesn't have dual factor on it. Uh, so that was always great. Um, and quite often you'd be surprised how often people had the same administrator password as this SA password on SQL, which is just dumb, <laughs> but it's, it's happened surprisingly often. Um, so I'd get the SQL authentication. I, um, I've got, um, I want to jump onto the rubber ducky topic. I, I, who here, does, does everyone know what a rubber ducky is? I mean, I guess who doesn't know what a rubber ducky is if, if, if they post it into the chat? Uh, okay. Okay, so a few people don't, a lot of people do. Uh, yeah, it's a hack thing, that's for certain. Okay, so rubber duckies are cool. And there's a few different variations of them. This here is called an OMG cable. And you can't really see it with this light here. Uh, and I don't think the zoom's that great, but the, the sticker on it, I've just put threat lock on it because I plugged it in by mistake and that went wrong. Um, it's essentially exactly the same as an iPhone cable. You cannot tell the difference. Like if you had two of them next to each other, side by side, you wouldn't be able to see anything different. Now, what this does is this is able to send keystrokes to your computer. Uh, yes, you can order these from Hack5, everybody. And you can, we're gonna post our scripts as well in the box drive so you can use those. Um, this is about 120 bucks. You can order it from Hack5. Uh, when you plug it in, it sends keystrokes to your computer. This one's even cooler because you can actually trigger those key keystrokes remotely. So this one here is the basic one. Um, this just looks like a normal USB drive. It's not a storage device. It's just a, uh, a keystrokes, but essentially a keyboard. It presents itself as a keyboard. And th this one you can trigger remotely. This one triggers on impact. There's also a bash bunny, which allows you to do a few more things. Um, I'm going to connect to my machine on TeamViewer here because I have a laptop here, which I'm going to plug this into. So I had TeamViewer downloaded here. I'm going to show you how this works. <laughs> now, I'm not sure which one has which script on, so we're going to find out. 
um, Liam sent me one. One of them we put safety in, so you have to hit the. And again, we're gonna we're gonna send you the scripts for these. So if if you if you do have rubber duckies on the instructions of what you need to do, just let TeamView install on here. Um, whatever. Um, I'm just gonna say I use it for personal use. It's working. Okay. I'm going to log on to this computer. I'm going to connect with using TeamViewer. I've been asked this question a few times about the box drive. We will give a URL to that. If it's not, and if the stuff's not in there now, we'll be uploading it afterwards. Yeah. So Liz will send out that URL. Um, if I can just go into, I'm just closing some stuff down on this computer. Yeah. Now, just on that, anything we put in there is for testing purposes only. Don't go and break into Bank of America or something. We don't want to be uh, responsible for that. Um, so I've got a test laptop here. Uh, Thanks, Liz. <laughs> Um, okay, um, so here is my um, laptop, and I'm going to use this for my next demonstration as well. And this is just a test laptop. So uh, I'm going to go, I just want to make sure I've turned off everything in Threat Locker because I don't want to block anything here. By the way, also, I believe the, uh, the one with the silver little thing on it is the browser exfiltration uh, script. Okay, that's about, okay, cool, thank you. I was just guessing. <laughs> so uh, I had a 50-50 shot. Um, okay, so if I go into computers. I was thinking that, Rick, by the way. Um, Rick's just pointing out, it's pretty nice for everyone to not hijack your session there. <laughs> oh, I, I, I knew that was coming. Uh, so I'm waiting for someone to hijack my session when they saw my password. I'm, I'm, I, I, I was I, thinking it, I was like, I wonder if anybody will. <laughs> I would have given them points for trying in fairness. I, I, I would have I would have been impressed, but I, I was uh, I, I, I said it this morning. This is not my laptop, by the way. So um that's your demo VM. <laughs> well that's my demo VM, but no, this one here is um <laughs> so please don't hijack my session just yet because uh, I've only got 25 minutes and I want to show you how I got onto that MSP, how I managed to get that MSP's password. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna plug this in here. And what it's doing, oh. it's a good idea not to hijack our sessions anyway. <laughs> so I'm going to do that again. What we can do. <laughs> right. Yeah, we, we don't want to get into a shit fight, throwing fight. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we all get messy. And uh, okay. Okay, I'm going to try, I'm going to do this again. So basically, when I plug this in, it sends the keystrokes to the computer. So you can see here it's typing out a thousand words a minute, and I'm typing out a PowerShell script. What it's going to do, if I look here uh, in, let me go into Google Cloud. Uh, okay, the um, what actually happened here is all of these files were uploaded from my documents folder. And I'll show you this in, I wish this TeamViewer thing would go away at the top. Um, I'll go into Threat Locker here as well, just to show you what happened in the background. If I'm just gonna say ring fence, and ring fence, if you, if you already use Threat Locker, you know this, it means it's denied, but the fact we're in monitor only mode means it was allowed consequently. Uh, you can see here what happened was PowerShell accessed um, these files. Uh, in my documents folder, and it also went out to Google Cloud. Um, now, the reason I point that out is we didn't need to run any software. So we could have done this in C Sharp, and if we got somebody to open it. But one of the things, and I've only used rubber duckies once to actually get in, well, I guess twice, um, but the once was just testing, and the other time was in a healthcare clinic um, that I was 
showing them I could get in. I came in, I plugged it in the back, I got on her machine. And then I, I didn't actually execute a script like this. What I did was execute essentially something that copied and replaced files on the file service so other people would execute. Um, but the, the point is I could have plugged that in. I could have downloaded a piece of malware and run it. Or in this case, I didn't need to download malware. I just used a PowerShell command to upload my data to the internet. I just essentially weaponized PowerShell. You can do the same with RegServe or RunDLL or anything. Um, why this is important is because PowerShell is not malware. It's on the whitelist. I mean, even if you're using ThreatLock, it was on the whitelist. And if you, I assume everyone knows what we do here, but we, we essentially have a default deny stance on not letting any software run unless it's the MSP that's approved it. But we make that really, really easy and multi-tenant and all of the other parts. Um, but we also allow you to ring fence applications to say, well, PowerShell needs to run, but it can't access my data. Um, so if by... In, in a, an attack like this, if you're doing an attack like this, you don't need to rely on software or malware. You can just use those tools. In that case, it sends the keystrokes. And uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna put the scripts up here and we're gonna put instructions on how to do this, but it's pretty damn easy to actually create a script. You just, the, the tr timing is a little bit tricky because sometimes you have to wait a little bit longer. If you don't wait long enough, it causes some problems. So that's just one rubber ducky script. It just uploads all the data to the internet. It literally, I, Michael wrote that script. I think it took you five minutes. Something like that, yeah. And there was no alcohol involved. So that's, <laughs> you get extra points for that. Um, the, um, the other script I have here is this one's, I almost think it's a little bit scarier because I, I was at a trade show yesterday and this morning and, and they do still exist. Uh, so, and uh, I noticed all of the vendors' laptops were left on their desks and none of them were locked. <laughs> and what this one does here, when I plug it in, it does have a safety on it. I think I have to hit caps lock or something just to make sure it's, Oh, no, I don't. I'm wrong. No, that looks like the other one. They're both the same one. Maybe there's a third one here. <laughs> if you can give me one second, because that's the same script. Run away, rubber duckies. Yeah. I hope I didn't give away the wrong rubber ducky. <laughs> I've got another one here. Look at this. There you go. This one's going to be it. That one just copy my data to the cloud again. Third time lucky. What this one does, have I got TeamViewer open here? Um, yeah, this one um, extracts all my Chrome passwords. So literally, I think it's supposed to open the app afterwards as well. There you go, it does. So it literally just, and this is just a fake password, by the way, so it's not going to do any good. It saved all my passwords from Chrome onto the rubber ducky. I don't know why I'm showing you the laptop screen because you can see it here. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's, um, it, you, it saved all of the passwords onto the rubber ducky from here. And I just put one in there because I was, I was quite impressed. I thought, I surely I've got something saved in Chrome. I try not to, but when I plugged it in yesterday, there was nothing there. So I created something. Uh, but it, I mean, if you literally plug this into any machine, you can just dump them out. Now, we don't sell password managers, but if you're ever trying to sell one, that's a great way of selling one. <laughs> you just plug this in and show them, I just got all your passwords. Do you really want to keep saving your passwords in Chrome? Um, it's a really easy way to sell it. Uh, yes, those scripts will also be in box. Now, this one's a little bit trickier. Well, this one here, I think what we're going to do, this one here saves it to the USB device. But Liam, you're working on one that actually uploads it so you can post it to a server so you don't even have to save it to the USB device. That'll probably yep. be a bit easier because this one requires you to flash the firmware of your, of your ducky. Was it, uh, what's the name of that flash? Uh, it's, uh, it's a twin duck. Uh, twin duck. Firmware. So it's able to be mass storage as well as a human interface device. Okay. So I want to go on to the final thing. Oh, actually, let me just double check. I didn't miss anything, but I know I'm close on time. And I, rubber duckies, oh, fileless malware. I think we've kind of gone into fileless malware a little bit. Fileless malware is essentially what we just did there. We used PowerShell and we can spin this up from Office. And if you go back to, if you, if you want to exploit vulnerabilities, there was one in Internet Explorer last year. But again, if they're patched, it's harder. But it's where you run something on the machine. So you run a PowerShell command rather than in installing malware. And th that's essentially what the rubber ducky just did. But you could also call that same rubber ducky script from a macro in a Word document. Uh, 
somebody asked what happens when I use a USB wall. I'm not sure because I've never come across one. What's a USB wall? Do you know what one is, Michael? Third wall feature. Oh, okay. Um, so it will not block it there at all. So, uh, so okay. So no, I mean, and we felt like it has storage control in its part. The storage control will not block a rubber ducky because it's a keyboard. Um, it, what, how we block it is we make sure you can't weaponize the tools. You can't weaponize PowerShell. Uh, but if you're using USB wall, uh, unless it's blocking all USB ports and you can't use keyboards, it, it won't block it um, because it's just a keyboard. In the the twin dock it will block because that's a storage device, uh, but it's it's not mass storage and even threat lockers mass storage will not block it. But our, that's why we ring fence the apps because we assume someone's going to spin up PowerShell. So if PowerShell can't access your network shares, which most of the time it doesn't need to and can't go out to the internet except to your RMM, it means it can't. Those attacks get kneecapped if you like, so they can't do much. Um, you can still well you can't even change someone's wallpaper because you have to download it from the web. Uh, but yeah, so the, the USB wall isn't going to help. <coughs> the, um, the next thing I want to talk about was how I got onto that MSP's machine. And I'm just going to, I want to show you the scenario. This is my machine here, or this is your customer's machine. You could even, you know, I've got so many pieces of malware on here that I've been playing with. I'm just going to do this here. And I'm going to show you from the MSP side. So... Now, hopefully everyone can follow here because I'm trying to do it on one screen. I'm the MSP and I'm connecting to my client's machine. So my client calls me up and says, I've got a problem with my machine. And this is what I did to this MSP. So, and I imagine you guys use TeamViewer or Screen Connect probably to connect to your client's machine. And so what you do is you, you go on, they say it's running slow or it says there's some Windows updates and they're going slow. So I asked him to go on, run Windows updates on my machine, just like a client you might do with a client. No, I didn't. I ran the updates this morning, but so I can't run them twice. But anyway, I'm going to say, I'm going to pretend I click check for updates because I can't click check for updates. So this is the client's machine, which in this case is my machine. And I'm getting him to connect to my, actually, I got him to connect to a VM and I did this from the physical host, but that's neither here or there. He's connected to my machine. Now my machine has malware on it. So he's connecting. I've got malware on my machine. And while he's connected, he checks for updates. Um, and it says it's going to take 14 hours like Windows does to download the update. So he minimizes his screen and he's just using, now he's sharing something with me while his screen's minimized that he didn't realize. So what I got him to do was I got him to log into his um, password manager. Well, I didn't get him to do this. He did it by himself. I got about seven passwords uh, in the day <laughs> and they're all really, really long passwords. And I don't think I have key pass on here. Downloads. Let's see if I got key pass on here. I don't, but let's just say I had keep. Uh, well, let me do it for the sake of. I'm just going to do this for the sake of getting it. I'll accept anything. See, if this is it's even. some point today, I'm going to get this to run. I think you should have connected to my machine. Yeah, well, I, I used two laptops this morning. One was uh, somebody else's. Now I'm using it sitting on my desktop. Uh, one was... Last week, I actually got an MSP to connect to it. And launch it. I think I just installed KeyPass. Uh, no. Okay, so I'm going to put a password in here. really basic you need to repeat it yeah it's too weak that's what it's doing no it needs to repeat it, it doesn't care if it's weak it won't let oh it will yeah i'll get there eventually guys <laughs> um okay so i want to copy my this is my rmm password so i'm going to copy my rmm password here and this is what he did um He's on his machine and that's all I'm doing now. I'm on my machine as the MSP. I've got no malware. I'm just connected to the customer's machine. In which case, this was actually me who was connected to. While he's on here, um, he also goes and... Um, have I got Slack on here? Yeah, he doesn't have that. Uh, so I'm going to... 
Uh, he's, I noticed he was looking at Office 365 scripts. So he was trying to run an Office 365 PowerShell command. Do you want me to slack your command? <laughs> you can, but it's going to cause me a bit of problems with my... Oh, slap me a command. That would be good. Because <laughs> I can... I can. Oh, no, I'll do it on here because I want to I want to do it. I want to show. I, I'll get anything here. Office... Oh, um... Do you want the URL? Uh, uh, yeah, the problem is I, I, I kind of had something running that's going to stop that working. Oh. Uh, yeah. So he, he had a big long command. I'm just going to say get mailbox. So he went in here, hit copy, opened up, apparently I've got stupid start menu on here, opened up PowerShell and pasted it. And I don't know if my screen is very clear, but you can see there it says your PC has been infected. Boom. So I'm, I'm guessing now, I want to see if anyone's figured that out. Um, and how many people are glad they didn't connect to your, your team viewer? <laughs> yeah, how many people are glad they didn't connect to my team viewer? <laughs> so, uh, there. Did anyone figure out what I just did? Yes, there you go. Shared clipboard. We share something with the MSP. So during this time, I was able to do a few things. One is I was able to get him um, to send, it doesn't seem to be working now, uh, maybe, do, do. I swear that should work. Um, one is I was able to get him to send his RMM password to me. So if you look at my machine, because I had something running on my machine, I was collecting his RMM password. The other thing I was able to do was those. I was able to replace his clipboard. Now I could replace a few different things. I can replace an exe if he copies a file with an exe. In this case, I replaced it, replaced a PowerShell command, and I also put the carriage return at the end so he couldn't think it. Although the paste doesn't seem to be working now, I also replaced his clipboard. I wasn't as nice. I'll be honest. I didn't replace it with Tinder. I replaced it with a website that's much much worse. It, <laughs> so, so, but I wasn't going to do that on a demo. I might get banned from future Connectwise events. I was also able to replace his clipboard. So while he was on his computer and he copied something into his Slack channel, he sent something a bit embarrassing to his team. Although that copy just suddenly isn't working, although it seems to be in my code. So I, I guess something went wrong with the clipboard mapping there. But the point is we had a shared clipboard. And when you use remote control tools, you know, you can turn these off but you use a shared clipboard. And the point of this isn't to tell you not to share. Well, you shouldn't use a shared clipboard unless you have to. I would, I would caution it. And when you're using it, I would be very, very careful about what you're putting in that clipboard because the clipboards are bi-directional. Somebody's asked a question, yes. When you connect to a remote access tool, anything they copy, you can paste on your computer. Anything you copy, you can paste on their computer. And that's good because you quite often want to do it. Who wants to top, type in that license key or that PowerShell command when you're connected to a client's machine? But if you don't need to share your clipboard, disable it. But also, if you're trying to trick someone, this guy was incredibly confident that I couldn't get him. And now I thought when I started this, um, I thought, oh shit, I'm never gonna get him to do something. I thought I'm gonna have to go after one of his staff. I'm gonna have to get one of his staff to open a file. I'm gonna replace files that he was using OneDrive, not on FileShare, but I would have replaced the files in OneDrive with executables, and then he's gonna open the executable one day. That, that was my plan. That was probably the most logical plan I could come up with. But this was the quickest way I could do it because I wanted to prove him wrong that day because I wanted to be a smart ass and he was annoying me because he was saying he's solid. Needless to say, he is actually deploying throughout Locker now. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, and I've known this guy for a long time. Uh, but the point is, is if you... If you think outside the box, I mean, I spend a lot of time just thinking about things and looking how software works. It's amazing what you can come up with, with tips, tips and tricks um, to get around security. I'm gonna finish with one more and I'm not allowed to say the company name. Uh, the, the pace is keystrokes um, is better because they can't set it, uh, but obviously it's one way too. So yes, if you're using ConnectWise Control, use the pace is keystrokes. Um, and the idea with this was not to scare the life out of you, just to show you another way that you could trick someone. Um, I'm going to finish on one other vulnerability we found. And I'm, I'm not going to tell you who it is because the, there's some, some rules around the, 
the the program we're in with ConnectWise. But there is a dual factor authentication program out there. And this is a known issue and it is publicly documented on the web. And we found it and we reported it to the company and their CEO said it was not something they called it a limited fleet feature flaw. But there's a very popular remote dual factor authentication solution out there. And with that dual factor authentication solution, when you install it on your RDP servers, it has um, an install key, a number of keys and URLs. And when you install it, you put those in. And when you go to log into your RDP server, you have to use the dual factor authentication. <coughs> and it sends essentially a push to you to say, do you want to allow access to this RDP server? Um, there is a vulnerability in this. I'm, I wouldn't, we, we get made the company fully aware before we disclosed it. They, their reply was, they do not protect the registry. But essentially, if you have remote registry enabled on a machine, if you know the admin password, you can still connect remotely to the registry. The registry key for that company are not protected. So what you can do is you can actually replace those keys to a different account of the same dual factor system. So you can go and sign up a free account, a different account, and then redirect the request to yourself. And, um, and I will not comment either way <laughs> on what it is and what it isn't. Uh, but, the, um, but you can essentially redirect that push request by enabling remote registry. Now, I'm not sure if we're here to tell you how to hack or how to make systems more secure, but maybe we get a bit of both. Um, disabling remote registry or setting permissions on the key would be a really, really basic concept. Um, or ring fencing your registry editing tools so they can't access those keys. But the point, the way we found that is we like to look at how software works. One of the things ThreatLocker does is we make sure all your apps work when you're using ThreatLocker. So if you have a policy for Screen Connect or if you have a policy for Microsoft Office, we like to make sure it works. And to do that, we have to look at what registry keys it uses and what it changes and, and things like that. So when we set these suggested ring fencing policies to say, don't let PowerShell access your file servers. We need to make sure that PowerShell doesn't need to access your file servers or don't let um, <coughs> this program change a registry key. We have to make sure that we know that. So we found that in pure error. Um, we did notify the company, but the point is, is as, as hackers or as enthusiastic hackers, the trick isn't to go out and find a book of the best tools. Cause what you're going to find when you do that is you're going to find rubber duckies and great, they're cool and they're really great demos. And you're going to find Metasploit and you're going to find some other cool common trips that everybody else is using. But the trick is to actually think a little bit what outside the box and just look at how software works. You'll be surprised how many vulnerabilities there are in software and how much you can use them against you. And if you just spend a bit of time, you, you kind of get to learn them and you get to learn these tricks. And some of it you can find from learn, searching how to hack. Others you can learn from attending sessions like this. We have a four hour one and I'm losing my voice after an hour and a half. So four hours is going to be interesting. And we're going to go into a bit more detail, but you can also just think a little bit yourself. Think, oh, I'm going to make this Word document. I'm going to, I mean, we came up with that Adobe hack where we redirected, we sent them, gave them the download and then redirected them to the Adobe page. You know, I managed to get IT guys to click on that because believe it or not, even IT guys look at the URL and say, oh, that is actually Adobe. And didn't think, well, I could have, that download could have started before the redirect. There's lots of little things you can do and it's very effective. Uh, wouldn't you still need remote access though? You need to own the box before you exploit it. So the question is, yes, you'd still need remote access, but the point of dual factor authentication is if somebody has your admin password, they can't get logged in. And if the, bot, if the RDP is open on the internet, which you just shouldn't be, period, if RDP is open on the internet and it's not going to work, you can't use remote registry from the in, from 3389. But if you're on somebody's network, I've seen car dealers get ransomware. I've seen hospitals get ransomware from a rubber ducky installing software, giving someone remote access to a machine. You're now on the LAN. If they are able to do a hash attack on a dictionary because the local admin logged onto one, the domain admin logged onto one of those machines one day. And then this attacker says, okay, now I'm logging onto the domain controller. Oh, dual factor authentication pops up. I've done really well not to say any names. <laughs> uh, dual factor authentication pops up uh, and then they say, okay, I need to go and redirect this to another account. So that's the point of that. And this isn't a be all, I mean, you should, the reason we have dual factor and I, I, I would never recommend removing dual factor. I just take uh, steps, more steps. Just don't assume that because you have dual factor that you're, you're stable uh, and people can't get your data. 
Um, <coughs> guys, we're about three minutes to go. Is there any questions anybody has before we finish off? And nobody is ever secure. That is right. There is no such thing. It's a hundred percent. I, I, I do not sleep at night ever. <laughs> I am so paranoid. And I mean, just to give you an idea on what threat locker looks like inside from the security, nothing of ours gets out to the internet at all. No servers, no anything. You can't write to a folder. We have storage policies in place. You can't write to a folder under system, under domain admin or anything, unless it's a, an open folder. So even if someone got through our dual factor, through our firewalls, through our dual factor on our firewalls, got onto one of our servers, managed to download something onto that server, even though they can't get internet access from the server, they still can't write to the folders because they've locked down. We are very, very paranoid and I still don't sleep at night. Uh, so if, um, and, and I think if you think like that as an MSP, you're going to be more secure than the other MSPs. And that is what will save you. You don't, you, you can't be completely secure, but if you can outrun your neighbors, you can then, you don't need to outrun the lion, just your neighbors and let them get hacked instead. Um, guys, I, I'm going to do, uh, do this. If, I, I, I didn't talk much about Threat Locker throughout this. If, I, I, if anyone does get time, I, would, I really suggest looking at Threat Locker. We do take a different approach to security. Uh, we focus on default deny on zero trust and really limiting access to stop these types of attacks from happening. Um, I have put, it, it's a 45 minute demo. I promise it's not a waste of your time. Um, if you do decide to, uh, I put the, the link in there if you want to book a demo. Um, uh, but it, uh, if you do decide to um, jump on a demo, you do decide to do a trial and you do install and lock down hundred seats. The first 50 people get free rubber duckies. <laughs> you don't have to buy it. You just have to trial hundred seats and lock them down. Um, in terms of what do we replace in the MSP industry, really nothing. Uh, we do stop ransomware, uh, but we stop it by de denying everything. We're not, we would, I would never consider us an antivirus. We don't look for bad things. We just deny by default. We tend to replace things like um, uh, carbon black bit nine in the big enterprise world. Uh, but in the MSP world, uh, we just um, complement and improve. Yes, uh, compliment and approve. And uh, Mark, you are a client and you can get a ducky. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm telling Sammy now across the room for me, uh, Mark Cliff. From, uh, uh, so you can get, um, you can get a ducky um, and you have more than 100 seats locked down. <laughs> um, yes, but it, it really is very, very effective. Um, and someone's just made a good point. It's similar to blocking traffic on your firewall. If you think about security like this, if you think about how we secured our firewalls, when, when hackers started happening and bad things started happening on the internet, <coughs> we didn't go out and say, I'm going to buy an antivirus for network traffic and decide automatically what to block and what not to block. We just said, we're going to create a firewall, we're going to block everything, and then we're going to open the ports we need. That's kind of what we're doing at an application level. Nothing runs unless it's trusted. Um, so, and we do, you deploy the agent and everything gets locked down, it learns for a week or what your environment looks like. And then after a week or two weeks or whatever it may be, you lock it down. And then if somebody tries to run something that's new and, and we're really talking about new software because the updates are tracked by us. If somebody does try to run something that's new, they're going to get a, um, a message okay. saying this is being blocked. Mark, I absolutely completely agree with your comment. Uh, you just need to send it to everyone, not just panelists. <laughs> so uh, there you go. I don't know if he can send to everyone. Actually, I'm sure he can. Uh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. See, Mark just said it. Uh, so essentially, if someone downloads a piece of malware and it's not on the list, like Putty isn't on the list, it's here. They can hit request permission. You get a ticket and you approve it. And simple as that. Guys, I. Uh, I appreciate everybody attending today. Um, hopefully we managed to keep you awake for the hour and a half. Uh, we, we have another one at IT Nation next month. It's a four hour group. If you do get a chance to book a demo, book a demo. Um, it, I appreciate, uh, you know, and uh, I look forward to talking to you soon. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you, Danny.